Oh my god. No, I thought we kept that door locked, don't we? Do we not? Do we not have locks around here anymore? Are you? Oh, it's you. Oh, man, my bad. Yo, I forgot you had an interview today. Listen, just get on the bus real quick. Just take a seat over here. You're gonna be meeting the bus in a couple minutes. Go ahead and get yourself comfortable and welcome in. Welcome in, everybody. This is episode two of the Meet the Bus podcast. I'm your host, Jeffrey Reckis. And today we have our very first interview on this journey of meeting the bus. And like I mentioned last time in the last episode, um, talking about where the journey starts in here. As we move along, we'll meet people that I had marched with in the past, maybe some other people. Who knows? Along the way, so far, this is as we're recording right now, today is Thursday, uh, September, I was going to say August, September 7th. It's two days since I released the first episode of the podcast, and the love has been crazy. Let me tell you that. Um, very blown away, very surprised by the um, like the reactions, everybody, and how like the support and the love for it off the bat. Um, I think that's why I was so like hesitant when I was recording and so rambly because I was just like, God, like it's all about the presentation of the idea, like nailing it the first time. And just like when it gets out there, like I hope it's just cool because it could like because I've released stuff before I've released music. I've talked about the music I produce for other artists I went to school with, like all that. And those like got views and stuff. But like, you know, I get love from like the homies and that's kind of it. But like this was like a different level of like support. Like I've heard from people and it's been so nice. I've heard from people that I marched with even for just one season in 2016 who like reached out to me and were just like, Hey, I'm listening to your podcast right now. Like, I love this. I actually listened to it when I was at work today. And this was like so awesome to listen to. I can't wait to see the rest of the episodes. Um, And we've already gotten like, we got a couple guests booked that day, like within the night of open, like, putting out the episode a couple people like already wanted to be like on the show um so yeah no i'm very excited for who's coming on next september is gonna be a very fun month for this i'm gonna i'm very excited for what september is gonna bring um maybe i'll mention that towards the end of the episode but uh three minutes in let me introduce the guests shouldn't i i think i should introduce the guests right i think i've been talking for a while now you haven't said a single word this whole time. No, How I'm about I be a good funny. host? <laughs> How about I be a good host and introduce our <laughs> guests? Come on now. Uh, let's get the Google Docs off to the side for me so I can just read my notes as uh, I do this little ting over here. Oh, yeah, I got notes. I, I got notes. I got <laughs> notes. After 22 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. He marched Pioneer Drum and Bugle Corps out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That's right, right? Milwaukee, Wisconsin? Yep. Correct. And uh, he marched with the Boston Crusaders from 2014 to 2016. He was the profile picture for the DCI Tuba Instagram page at one point. I do remember that. Whenever I march, I put that down as a little, little fun fact, actually. I still yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Fun no, fact, he still no. checks in. I check in just to see. <laughs> so I still searches the page every once in a while just to make sure. <laughs> no one better fucking take that down. It's a pretty sweet picture. It's a pretty sweet picture. Honestly, my my I gotta put it in for the thumbnail for sure. Um, Absolutely. we're coming up with thumbnails as you we go along I, here. I don't want but that. um, yes. After all of this, Pioneer Drum and Bugle Corps, Boston Crusaders. He was a tuba player. Everybody, please welcome on Jason Reckis to the show for episode two. My brother. Hello. Um, Thanks for having me. How are you me. doing? What's What's been going on today? What's been going on? You know, just grinding out the work. Living the life. Living. Speaking of living, by the way, I mentioned in the first episode um, about you living. Know. Do you want to tell the Do you want to tell the people? Secret? I didn't want to like, you know, huh? It's a secret where I live. Well, I. Oh. I no? just didn't want to. I don't want to blow up your spot. Host, let me let me let me talk a little. <laughs> um, I live in Austin, Texas, and I sell medical software to home health and hospice agencies. Hell yeah, dude! That's that good shit, right? There. There. <laughs> yeah. 
That's awesome. Okay, so I guess since this is a drum corps podcast, and um, you know, maybe we should talk about drum corps a little bit. I think we've talked about maybe. Maybe. water, the apartment. Uh, Wait, what is drum corps? I didn't hear about that in the first episode. As oh you. my god! I really <laughs> didn't introduce that, huh? I kind of just said, "Hey, if you know, you know, and if you don't you know, know, go fuck yourself." <laughs> you don't. Know. <laughs> um, do you wanna do you wanna tell the people what you think drum corps is? Professional marching band, as I tell professional marching band. As I tell many people who don't know about the activity or not really a part of the music world, I just tell them it's professional marching band for age of fourteen to twenty one, twenty two. Uh that you can four and you go off into the summer. Yeah. I I think I think we're moving to that point where they're going to change that age gap for sure. Oh, I, um, I think so too. With the way the activity's kind of moving forward, what do you say? Seventeen or eighteen. I think yeah, be I think it's like for world class, yeah. like world class is going to be that seventeen, eighteen to twenty one, and then open class being fourteen to seventeen. Yeah, I think and that's it. I I think that just makes sense. Um, yeah. Speaking of, but, when did you start, by the way? What age did you start? 17. 17? 17? Damn, it's been a while. That. Guys, he's old. How old are you? 20, 28. 28? Going on 29. Almost at the big 3-0. <laughs> You're getting old. 11 years ago, I did this. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be good this is gonna be really good um so i guess we tell the people do we expose you that you're not actually like a tuba player primarily you're not you're you're a saxophone Malana player B. primarily <laughs> and we're on it you're a fake fan fake you're fan. not a swifty dude <laughs> <laughs> yes, so so how how does your musical journey start? How do we get into this? Because obviously I know as your brother that you were a saxophone player starting out, but if you want to tell the people a little bit how you got here and how you started playing tuba. Good question. So I was a saxophone player since fourth grade. Fourth grade? Fifth grade. Fifth grade. So the age of 10, started playing saxophone. Mm -hmm. Played saxophone all the way through middle school. I played saxophone all the way through college, but got to high school. First year in high school, wanted to be a marching band. As many kids who don't have the background of knowing what drum corps is, found out about marching band through the movie Drumline. Just hey, like man. Know. <laughs> Just Shout like us all. <laughs> Shout out Nick Cannon. <laughs> So I knew right from that movie I wanted to be in marching band. Got to high yeah. school, got in marching band, and two weeks, second week of band camp happened, and our tech at the time, Jason Bergman, shout out. And Jason. was this freshman year out the gate, like that you knew kind of that you that you kind of wanted to go into this? Yeah. So. That second week, he showed us a video of 2008 Phantom Regiment, Spartacus, and that That's was the that was the summer I started marching band. Was Spartacus? So right after That's... final, he had come back. Oh I God. didn't realize it until I just said it. Um, but I, that is crazy! What a summer to start, Spartacus. I know you're old. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to tell Mama. I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I saw that and I was like, that's that's something I want to do. And yeah. I thought at the time I could be a drummer. Don't have that coordination to do that. Uh, Mom and Dad got me drum lessons. That lasted about a month. I forgot about it. That's Holy not for me. What a face. <laughs> <laughs> oh my and God. I had some friends who marched Madison Scouts at the time. I was like, mm -hmm. I want to go there. Yeah. But obviously, being a saxophone player, I'm like, I can't learn a new instrument. I can't play drums. I can't do anything. So 
go through freshman, sophomore year, saxophone player. And that summer of junior, going into junior year, uh, another tech of ours, Josh Klaus. Shout out, Josh. Shout out, Josh, dude. Shout out the, the boy. OG. We have to get him on here. You got to get and him we on. Should, we have to get him on the podcast. Absolutely. have to get him on here. He started it all. He came up to me week one of band camp and said, you want to play tuba? And I was like, I don't, I don't know how to play. As a saxophone, saxophone player, what goes through your head when yeah. you hear that? Like, so hey, I you want to pick like, up this heavy ass shit and like yeah. you're like a kid in high school and like, like, you're like, and not I can't really. Play. And he's like, I'll teach you. And I'm like, okay. And we finished rehearsal. And I was like, I'm going to do it. And he's like, you can do drum corps if you do it. I'm like, sweet. I'm like, and yeah. was that like, and what were you going to say? I said, you got to teach me. Yeah. Easy. <gasps> oh, no. Oh, I lost you. You're back. No, you're back now. You're back in. That was like a five second in and out. Internet connection must be weird. Is it mine or yours? I don't know. It had like a little icon on the screen, but I think we're rolling. You're good now and I'm good. We're rolling. So I think we're rolling better. now. Let's just keep going. Okay. So yeah, let's just keep going. He told me he wanted me to be a tuba player. I said, okay, you got to teach me. Mm-hmm. Finished rehearsal, walked out. Mama sitting there and was like, where's your saxophone? I'm like, I'm going to be a tuba player. And she just laughed. <laughs> Like she does. Shout out Donna. <laughs> I Shout know out D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Loyal fan. Uh, and from then on, I just started learning. Josh taught yeah. me everything. I went through that fall on tuba and mm-hmm. then immediately said, I'm going to audition. And I Now, where was your first, where's your first audition? I think you were leading into this. So my first one, I was determined to go to Madison Scouts because everyone on our staff marched Madison and everyone who came from our high school marched Madison. So I was like, that's where I got to go. That's where everybody was, goes. Was there a show in particular from Madison that kind of inspired you that was like, dude, this product right here is the reason why I'm going to do this? At that time, no. The no, show it was just I, like, it was just the people. It was the people and yeah. Spark. And so That's cool. I went and I auditioned. And this is 20- now what year is this? This is 2012. 2012. Yeah. No, 2011. I got okay. On. Actually, backtrack. The show that inspired me was 2011. Madison. The Madison. Classic. The- uh, it's like New York Morning. Yeah, the New York Morning one. Yeah, the one that ends with uh, Empire State of Mind. Is that 2012? No, 2011. That was that show. That was that one. Like the ending with the whole like 9/11 theme. 2012 was the. Uh, yes. They did the DVD off of 2012, which is super cool, by the way. They need to yeah. keep doing those, like the yeah. DVDs. Like I think one of the last years they did DVDs was like your last year. Yeah. Was like 20 the 75th that was 2013 no 2013 was the 75th you're right yes because that was yep. the the whole army from theme the with the guy at the beginning yeah yeah from, uh, yeah the mark Wahlberg movie <laughs> the mark Wahlberg movie that's all I know um about. so when you're <laughs> when you were walking <laughs> did, did you drive or did you fly to this first audition? I drove. I don't remember. Okay. I drove because it was in Indiana. So okay. Madison always hosted auditions in Indianapolis or around there. I think it was yeah, yeah it was right outside Indianapolis. So my first yeah. one was there. And then I made it through the weekend, got to Sunday and got cut. No, I wasn't a good tuba player at that point, and, and I couldn't play a, well, but I could hold the horn and I could do the part. So I yeah. thought that was good enough. Clearly not. Um, from there, I auditioned with Blue Stars. 
That's and true. so the following month, I went to a Blue Stars camp, also mm-hmm. in Indiana. Got an alternate. Now, position. what was the inspiration behind uh, going to Blue Stars? Was there just anything, or was it kind of a when you got cut? Was there a uh, that was the next were they telling you? But they were just so, like, you should go uh, here. Because that's that's something that happens. I think that's worth talking about, and I think that's a very that's a very clutch thing in the activity. Uh, something that helped me out along the way too. I wouldn't have found my first home if it wasn't for that those cut lists and yep. like staff telling you, "Hey, by the way, like there are homes for you in other places, and there's other like pe- like groups looking for you know players. Like go check these out." If it wasn't for that, you know, um, if they just like flat out cut you and just said like. Yeah. Eh, on the yeah, next one, but I think us, that's always been cool. Yeah, 100%. They gave yeah. us, they told me to go to Blue Stars, and then they said Pioneer at that point. I didn't really know about Pioneer. Yeah. And I do the Blue Stars camp. I get a two. So the, back then there were the ratings of one, two, or three. One, yeah. you're getting a contract. Right. I don't know if you do it today, still or not. But one, you get the- a contract. They did it in 2019. Okay. They still they still were doing it in 2019. Yeah, some of them, some groups do like, I know Blue Coats. I think do like a whole point system. Yeah, I know Cavaliers. When I went there in 19, were doing like a one, one minus two, two plus. Like it started turning into a whole plus minus thing. Like yeah, when know. it when it kept going on, it it started being like, well, if you have a one, but this kid's a one minus. And then a two yeah. plus plus, it could be something like they kind of developed into that. But yeah, no, they still they do a variation. Uh, what? Way too high. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. like if you see like a two plus, you're like, damn, yeah. dude. I'm like, I might be on I'm the right top there. Of the no, you're not. Next no, you're camp, not. they're yeah. like. <laughs> yeah. Um, one question I had for you. Um, early on, um in these audition processes at these different places that you went to, uh, I'm curious, especially starting in 2012, because obviously I know the environments of what it kind of felt like auditioning in the years from 2016 to 2020, what those rooms kind of felt like. I'm curious to know back in 2012, what did those rooms feel like? Because nowadays in camp season, there's a lot of media that's there covering these cores, whether it be their own groups their own media doing it or somebody else in DCI, there's a lot of cameras on these people now. So it feels a lot more, don't know how to quite say it, but like there's going to be some things that are like held back. You know what I'm saying? And it's, it feels a lot more like, um, I don't know. There's, there's, it seems more fun. It always felt nerve wracking going into one of those auditions because yeah, I don't know, especially as a kid growing up, it was, it was very uh, nerve wracking. So, how was it back in 2012? How were those? What were the vibes? What were the emotions like walking in? Was it friendly? Was it cutthroat? Were people cool? Like, what were the vibes? It was cutthroat at times. Um, Madison audition, it felt like you needed to know who you knew to get moving. Yeah. Uh, there was always just like any. At that point in your life, you're in high school. Any high school or any college, there's always those cliques. The friends mm-hmm. who know their friends, that's how it was. Yeah. Um, when I went to Blue Stars, it was also the same thing, friendly, but you know, you stuck with who you knew. Um, yeah. Then with Pioneer. Yeah, let's talk about how, do, how does Pioneer come into the picture and how do we get there? So Blue Stars, I get a two, and I get told I'm going to have an alternate spot. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I'm not going to go to the summer being a 17-year-old, not going into this. I didn't want to go into it not knowing if I'd have a spot. Right. And so I decided to go for one more group. I sent in a video audition for Pioneer Mm -hmm. and called me back after a week and offered me a spot right then and there nice and i was like i don't know who what group this is i don't know anything about them by the Uh, way i have to mention though i'm sorry to cut you off but you had to say how you got the contract because it is one of the most unique things i've ever seen in my life still to this day and i've like 
I've seen plenty of people get contracted, but how you got contracted specifically that summer, do you remember? No, you have to remind me. It was, <laughs> we were sitting like at the dinner table. We were just chilling. At that point, I didn't even oh. think it was a thought on your mind that you were going to march that summer. After the whole Blue Star situation, it was like, Oh, maybe we like head on to next summer, you know, because like Pioneer wasn't even a thing. You were just like, no, oh, like I'll just wait next summer. We'll like build it up and we'll go again. And the phone rings at the table. I don't think this would ever happen again, by the way. I don't think I don't know if anyone else would do this. If they do, that's crazy. But it was like, bro, it was like the goddamn NFL. Like he got the call. It was like, what? Unknown oh, number? Like, hello? And it's like, yeah, you got the contract over the phone, by the way. Not even an yep. email. You got the call. So I think got that's the pretty call, cool. call, and then the email was sent out with the contract. And I didn't know who this was. I was like, this, there's no way this is real. And yeah. they, the next camp is the St. Patrick's Day camp, and we're doing a parade that day. And I was like, what? What is this? I can't. Like, yeah, that's so much. That's intense. Because you got to be doing a parade. And I, I was like, okay. And camp was always <sighs> in Milwaukee. Yeah. No, no remote camps. Uh, camps in Milwaukee, go to camp. And did the parade in downtown Milwaukee. Learned the nice. music in two days. The group, the group at that time was small. I think they mm-hmm. were. Normal size is what one fifty. This group. Yeah, was. nowadays, nowadays one fifty, one fifty four. We had about a eighty of us, and the horn line consists yeah. of about twenty. Hey, Amen. And we went out and did the parade. I was like, okay, this is where I'm going to be this summer. <laughs> and, and there, at that point, there was six tubas. Yeah. And then go to move ins. We do a parade the first week because it's Memorial Day. So we do a Memorial mm-hmm. Day parade and learning everything. And within two weeks, I am the only tuba on the field. Were there others like before this? Were there were there others or there was, just like? There was five of us. And it dropped down to just you? Yes. How? Like, is it just like... One of them quit. Two got injured and quit. <sighs> That's dude. The other didn't oh show God. up. I don't remember. But 17-year-old Jason wild. was like, okay, I guess I'm... I'm the Fuck, it. One Fuck it, we ball. <laughs> and I'll never forget it. I called home. I think it was two weeks out of the first show. Mm-hmm. Or three weeks out of the first, no, two weeks out of the first show. Called home, called my boy, Andrew Lemaire. I said, Andy hey, Lemaire. you want to march? He's like, I can't. And I'm like, you play tuba? He's like, yeah. yeah. I'm like, there's Hell only yeah. one. We need another Please. one. <laughs> and he came out, and it was me and him. Then who else was on that? And then was this 2012 that he came out? Uh huh. Okay. My first summer was his first summer and his only summer. I had a I had a question uh, going into that first summer. Um, mm-hmm. I remember what it was like leaving for the first time, leaving home, and. Yeah. Um, that feeling of like, you know, because you, when you get contracted and, you know, the thought of it and the idea of like, oh, I'm going to go do drum corps. That's super sick. And you start telling all your friends and you're like, I'm going to go on tour this summer and perform all over the country. And everyone's yep. like, dude, that's sick. That's going to be great. Oh my God, I can't wait to see you and all that. And you're so excited about it. And then we, you know, we drove you up to Milwaukee. I'll rem- I never forget it. You know, we drove you up to, to Pile Land, right? Mm-hmm. Like the place where you all stayed at. And... You know, we drove you up there, and then from there, it's just like dropping you off, and you're on the other side, and you're gone yep. for the summer. So, as, especially um, being in high school from a 17 year old's perspective, what were when you walk through that door for the first time after we drop you off? You're 17 years old, and you know, and it kind of sets in for the first time. I'm gonna be gone 
and not see my family, like my friends for a minute. It's going to yeah. be a while. What's that feeling like? It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. You're, like what's going through your head when you're walking through? Why am I doing this? <laughs> uh, uh, like right away, day zero, like what the hell? Yeah. I'm like, what am I doing here? And yeah. you're second guessing it. You're, you're not going to see your family. You're not going to see your friends for three months. Sometimes a month, obviously with shows, but like to, realistically, you're not going to go home for three months. It doesn't and, feel like that long, but no. it, it and then really kind of is. You realize like, that's your home. That's your every home day, every day. And as the summers go on, it gets easier. Mm. I think going to that helps set me up for college. Yeah. Going away from college, going to another state, it sets mm -hmm. you up for that or sets you up for a big move where you're just going to move away for a while. It sets you up for that. So I think in that sense, I look back on it, I'm appreciative of it. But at that time, you're like, okay, I'm not going to see like anyone for a while. Terrifying. This is and it. also because you don't, you don't know anybody. Because yeah. at that point, Andrew hadn't come yet. So it's, it's oh. just you on the other side. You yeah. don't know anybody. And you're like, well, here we here go. I am. Here we go, I guess. Here we go. So um, I guess if uh, – let's see. Something else I wanted to talk about, um, just moving along throughout the season. Um, uh, let's see here. What was Pyle in, and what was that like? Speaking of like moving there, what was that all about? So Pyle Land is two grass fields mm -hmm. and a garage, and all the equipment is there. And that's where we rehearsed every day for all of movements. So yeah. we stayed at school close by and we went to Pile Land every day and we'd rehearse, eat, everything from there. Everything just happened there for us. Cool. But it was good. It was good to, it wasn't like we had to line any new fields or anything like that. We had one yeah. center place that we went just staying in one place How, like going that, on to, cool to like see that like i was like oh does every core have their own like land like that they area yeah. yeah and then and, of course as you go on to other places right you're just at college or something like that right and and at boston too for move-ins i think all the years you were there did you guys only stay at castleton or did you move around during spring training we moved around my first year in 2014 yeah. to Massachusetts. We went to Vermont. We went to Maine. Yeah. So we stayed in Castleton for a bit, and then we went to Maine for two weeks, and then we started our tour. What do you think about, like, I'm a big fan of the moves every couple of weeks in I spring training, especially. It, yeah. It, it gives you something to look forward to. Especially like talking about how long a spring training can feel, even though it's just like a month. I mean, in 2017, I had a six week spring training, and that was still one of the worst things of all time. Six weeks is crazy. Yeah. When you see any core does a over of movements, yeah. and you're not moving anywhere, not you're just anywhere. there. It, it gets, gets old. I'll never forget him, Pioneer, two weeks in, and Pio Land is right by the airport. And you see those planes go out every day. And I just look up. I'm like, what am I doing? What am it's I like doing? Tomorrow, tomorrow I could go. Yeah. <laughs> I could go tomorrow. <laughs> and like people would come and go. People would come and go. So I'm like, Yeah. What if I do? What if I do? Yeah. So speaking of that, because it, it can get tough, obviously, with the vibes of staying in one spot. And then now we move on to tour and mm -hmm. with pioneer for the most part, I don't think it helps that the member size was like smaller than a lot of groups, but yeah. talking on vibes throughout a season where you're kind of scoring low over and over again throughout a season. Um, how like, 
what's going like what's going through everyone's head what are the vibes for a gr- like a group that's because i've been there before where the group is just kind of we're always just placing and scoring down in those like what the vibes are the next day like especially on tour like what's what's going through everybody's head just like anywhere in the top 12 you're just battling to see if you can beat the next person up so 2012 our goal is to beat jersey surf at that point yeah every show beat them and we in 2012 we had a great mentality we had a great brass staff great visual staff to help us our staff was great and we just worked our ass off every mm-hmm. day to try and get better and better and better um and there was just a lot of that group in 2012 was small but they worked hard yeah what i think that's super doing. important because it, especially when you're scoring wasn't, low yeah go ahead there go wasn't ahead. any i just want to be in that other group over there when you go to shows there was that's huge cool, we're here we're gonna we're gonna perform really we're, but we're gonna perform i think oh. that's what I enjoyed the most of 2012 yeah there was no, oh, I wish I was over there right now. Like, oh, I can't wait to get into the stadium and watch them. Like, of course, there's mm. always going to be that. But, like. Right. I, but for I the was, majority. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. Always, but, like, that group was like, we want to be us. That's so like, huge. Oh, my God. I try to tell everybody that who marches like a sub-12 group because, I mean, I was there, too. Like, in 2018 until Florida. By the way, we started in Oregon. And it wasn't until Florida that we hit 70. Mm-hmm. And, like, it, we got, like, delirious to the point where we're in Florida writing the number 70 on our chest before a rehearsal because we're like, we might hit it tonight. And, like, throughout the whole tour, I remember just, like, with the number being low, the motivation coming back every single day gets harder and harder to keep wanting to be there. And so many people, especially in those cores, especially if you're almost, you're kind of competing top 15, you're like, yeah. oh, like people start thinking like when I marched those groups, people were already talking in San Antonio. We would have talks like underneath, like I would hear people. And in 2018, I was having those talks too. But like in prior years as well, people would be already having talks in San Antonio like that week being like, where are we going next year, boys? Like, where are we all going to audition together? Like in 2018, that kind of started early. But like the years before, I couldn't believe it because I was like, guys, we're here for like the summer. Like, this is us. This is it. But like, it's just, I, I think that's so cool that a group that small is still able to stick together and be like, this is us. No matter what, we're still out here to just like work hard every single day. Yeah. I think mean, that's huge. That's a huge mentality to have. Mm-hmm. Um, now, just a just a little like rehearsal show question. So a lot of top groups, like, and I, I bet you experience this at Boston too a lot, especially towards the end, but a, a lot of groups will like change parts of the show every single day on tour. How often was a group like Pioneer like changing their show on a day-to-day basis on tour? Like even just parts, you know? That's kind of uh-huh. a specific one, but like I feel like a day like day to day life in the tour, you'll always get one thing in a block before a show where it's like, well, especially when you start getting up there too. That's like, hey, we need to hit these sets because we're changing this or we're making this small change today. Yeah, I feel like that, that was happening was, all the time. It didn't happen as much at Pioneer as it did once I got to Boston. Like we needed to tweak stuff to make it better so we could keep climbing. Right. Um, so obviously we go through a season, it's a great season, you know, first year and everything. Um, on your first finals night, um, when it all ends, I kind of talked about this in the first episode, what the feeling is like when you finish and you're done and the finals and the final performance is done, the scores are announced, everyone's in the parking lot and it's time to say goodbye. What were the feelings like on your first finals night? My first finals was we we stopped after quarterfinals because we didn't make right. semi. Mm-hmm. So it was a lot of just hanging out with everyone on semifinals and finals and doing our thing. And we finished, and it just felt like it wasn't real. I, yeah, just done. that's your family. Can- for the summer, and you're just like bye. 
that's it. It it never feels like it actually is ending. No. And then it ends and you're like, whoa. And you go back to, for me, I went back to high school my senior year and the first week just didn't feel real. That was my next question. That was my next question was, what was your attitude like coming back? Because I think, I mean, I know what mine was like and I've worked at a high school before too, where like, I mean, a lot of the things about directors are like, you know, the attitude of kids coming back, um, kind of shitty sometimes, but can you like explain why that kind of is from our perspective of why? Because I, I, after doing it and then teaching at a high school and watching a kid come back from marching and watching his attitude, I was like, bro, like I, I've been here. I completely get you. I understand why now we need to learn to control this. You know what I'm saying? But like, what was, what was like, what's going through your head? Like, is there, cause for me, when I came back, like my first year, I had no motivation to do like anything school wise or like yeah. anything for that matter for like a couple weeks for sure. It was like, why, what am I doing? Like, I don't want to do this shit. I was ready to get back to marching band at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, so wasn't good. It's okay. Wasn't yeah. Good started uh you know when you have a, a director who wants to talk down to you right because of what you did where you marked yeah that's always difficult cool. to yeah yeah um but the staff besides him was supportive of everything at that time there was a um, lot of staff there that marched too so i think they kind of just yeah. got the understanding there was a lot of asking questions on like how'd you do this how'd you do that like what can we do to help out our uh, mm-hmm. rehearsal? Like, what what should we do that you did over the summer that could help us? Yeah. And that was a cool feeling and, like, helping that out. And obviously that fall we have an incredible, incredible season. Um, yeah. No, it was I, cool. It was a very fun year to watch. Lucky coming back that our drill wasn't written yet until I got back to high school, so I didn't have to learn as much as quickly. I didn't have yeah. to catch up like everybody else. I was learning. Oh my god, that. dude! Talk about how easy it is to learn drill after doing drum corps and you it come back and so do a high school easy. show. <laughs> you know, like any, by the way, any drill at all just becomes any like drill is a breeze after drum yeah. corps. Yeah, it's no so what, easy to do. Like yeah, yep. Drill is easy and learning music easy. So so easy. Anything seems like cake after that. Mm-hmm. Like after that first summer, you're like, yeah, I could literally anything musical, I got it. Two seconds. Yeah. Like it's no big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, so we move on. Uh, we've spent a lot of time in these early years, which is cool too, but we're gonna kind of speed up here because I want to talk about these Boston years. These Boston years are some really fun years, 14, 15, and 16. Good stuff to talk about in there. But um Coming back, you went back to Pioneer in 13. Uh, did you audition anywhere in 13 coming back? Or was it just like we're going back, doing it again? I auditioned at Madison mm-hmm. and Vanguard before that season. Don't really tell anyone about it because at that point, if you're auditioning other places and you're going back, like it looks bad. It's tough. It's yeah. tough. Like The staff's like, why are you doing that? You're coming here. It um, kind of depends. Yeah, it kind of um, depends on your staff. And, like, yeah, because, yeah, I feel you. Um, but I audition at Madison, I get cut again. I audition at Vanguard, get cut. And then I go back to Pioneer at that point. And graduated that summer. So it took a little bit of time to get to Pioneer at that point. Kind of got there on a bad foot. Um with some situations, uh, the director, uh, Mm -hmm. being mad that I'm late, but I'm trying to finish high school and blaming Mm -hmm. it on with Madison. Uh, so yeah, shitty situations, but I show up three weeks in to move ins, learn the drill, go about it. I do summer and I kind of knew when the summer started that I was going to work hard and mm-hmm. progress so that I could go somewhere. This is like I, honing I, in on your craft for the summer. Mm-hmm. And I was yeah. 
just going to do me, get through the summer, work my ass off, play better, yep. go into the fall, play better, and go somewhere. And at that point, goal is Madison still. Cause Madison, yeah, I was going to say, I was going to ask, one of my questions like was, when did you know that it was Boston in for, for 2014 or did, or did you like, did you not know? Was it just like, this kind of just fell in your lap or did you know? I looked at Boston um, in 2012, actually uh, that finals performance in 20, no, 2013. I watched Boston. I watched rise. Mm -hmm. And at that mm -hmm. point, I was still obsessed with going to Madison because of the 75th. The 75th oh, was yeah. on the list. But I watched her eyes and I was like, this is incredible. And it was Boston. It was hard. Boston yes. Yeah. We, or we grew up there. So I'm like, that would be cool to march a group from there. But they're too good. Oh, yeah. I forgot. We're both from Boston originally, by the way. We were both born in Massachusetts, raised they're there. Right. And yeah. Got to <laughs> represent. Yeah. I forgot about that. Didn't but at that, that point, I look at Boston and I'm like, I can't make that group. They're too good. Mm -hmm. they're way too good. So we get to quarterfinals. Quarterfinals is not a good run. I walk off right. that field and I said, that's it. I'm done. Gone. And I start watching every group, yep. quarterfinals, and see where I want to work hard and audition. At that point, it's still Madison. Yeah. So I go right into it in August and September at college. I start working. I get some lessons. Um, I'm also teaching at this point. This is my first year teaching. Want to talk about Lance at all? At Waukesha? Yeah? yeah? Go well, into it. So Lance, shout out Lance. Incredible person. You shout out Lance. Today without Lance. Um, he mm -hmm. was my brass caption head at Pioneer those two years. Um, and halfway through 2013 offered me a job to come teach up in Wisconsin. Mind you, I'd never been to Wisconsin besides with Pioneer. So I'm like, I don't know yeah. how I'm going to get up here, but I go to <laughs> Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. And at the end of the summer, um, what is it? Semifinals day. He's like, Hey, we have to go to lunch and we go mm -hmm. to lunch. The rest of the staff who's there, I meet everyone, meet now a good friend, Tony Holm, who I also nice. taught with, snare drummer at Madison before me and also taught at Pioneer and Madison. Um, and he lives in Chicago too. And they're like, you guys are just going to ride up together. I'm like, mm -hmm. cool. All right, let's make this work. So that fall, I start teaching right out of high school. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm going to learn. Yeah. Um, so I teach that whole year. And in the meantime, I'm also working to get into audition mode already because I know it's coming up. I go and do my Madison audition. First audition. I usually made it to about the second audition and then I get cut. First audition. Cut. Out the gate. So three what? years in a row cut from Madison at this point. Was this the same staff from 12 and 13 that was there in 14? Or no, at this point? Yeah. Yeah. At okay. this point. Most of the same wow. staff. Um, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So fast forward through the fall season. I'm looking at Troopers. Yeah. And I'm looking at Blue Stars again. And we go to BOA, Grand Nationals. Mm-hmm. And we perform, and then we have, I want to say, two days of just hanging out at BOA. So yeah. I walk around all the booths because they have all the drum corps booths at BOA. I'm walking around, and I see the Boston booth. I walk by it twice. I'm like, oh, that's yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. And I walk by, and I sit there for a minute. And I'm watching the video, and they have Rise on. I'm like, this would be cool. It's dope. I start talking dope. to Rico. Son, Rico is a color guard member. He did um, video. He did video for Boston eventually, right? No, he was on he staff. Was like, he was I on thought staff. he did like I, – I feel like I remember seeing him do like social media stuff like the YouTube for you guys at some point. I don't know. 
Maybe I'm thinking of somebody else. I don't know. Anyway, keep going. But I started talking to him, telling him my story. And yeah. they were like, why don't you go out? Why don't you go out? Um, and yeah. uh, Lamar, who was the color guard caption at the time, was also there at the booth. And I talked to him. And he's like, you need to come audition. And he's like, send me the tape. He's like, here's my information. I found him. I sent in my tape and I told him I sent in my tape for auditions. Let me know how it goes. Yeah. I get a call that I'm, I have a call back. Nice. Uh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Now Boston always had, uh, camps in Florida. My uh -huh. go to Florida. Gotta so go. I go to January camp in Florida. And that's the callback camp. I get there and there's 23 tubas trying out for 12 spots. For 12. Y'all did 12 only. Because yeah. a lot of the groups now, it's interesting, a lot of them are like buffing up to like 16. Yep. So like we 12. 12. <laughs> and I knew most of them were vets. And then there was a lot of rookies. So I'm looking around. I'm like, I've never been in a room of this many. A like, lot of dogs. Spot. I'm like, I don't think I'm getting it. And we go through the audition and get through Friday, get through Saturday, do my visual audition. And then Saturday night, they're usually pulling people out of block and telling them if they got a contract or if they're moving on to the next camp. Get to this Sunday. Is Saturday night? night? Saturday night, they're telling us, yeah. Damn. And I never had that happen in my years. It was always Sunday afternoon. It was like right before it everybody on, left. On Saturday night into Sunday morning. When I was oh, yeah. There. Like it started Saturday night yeah. going into the next. Oh, dude. Yeah. So I'm hearing a lot of the tubas who I'm talking to. They're like, yeah, we got our spot. Or yeah, we got our call back. And you're oh, like, oh, God. no. Okay. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm prob my audition probably didn't go well. Sunday comes around. I'm walking. And I go to the last block. And I was like, I, no one's talked to me. Like, I guess I'm just going to the callback camp. Yeah. And my tuba tech, Tim Leonelli. Shout out nice. Tim. Incredible. We're name dropping on this episode, dude. There's so many names just getting so dropped. So many names. But he was my brass tuba tech in 2014. He mm -hmm. comes up to me. Hey, has anyone talked to you yet? Like, no. <laughs> no Wait, way. And I'm like. What, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah. Hey, um, we're giving you a spot. Yeah, like what the hell? I, <laughs> I was like, what, do you, what do you mean? What do you He's mean? Like, you, you got your spot. You're, you're, you're on in. The <laughs> and I was standing in the middle of the school, just like, just dumbfounded. I made it. Oh shit! Like, so, like, uh, what's going through your head there? I was. At a loss for words, I was like, I'm going to Boston. I'm going to where I grew up. I'm going to yeah. do it. Elite and, uh, group at that time as well. I mean, now, as well now, but, like, then, too, like, so much prestige history there. I mean, like, they were really coming up. Like, those shows were, like, those were some heaters. Those were good yeah. shows. So, to, like, oh, Yeah. That key, I don't know if you were, I don't know if I stopped the thought process there, but I just think that's like that feeling of when you finally make it, especially like if you had to start at a lower group and you're constantly working to get better at your craft and then you mm -hmm. finally make it to a destination that you've been working to get to. You want to, because you feel like you're working at that level. And when someone finally like tells you like, hey, like, no, you are good enough to come in. Like we're giving yeah. you this spot. To me, when it finally happened for me, it was like, because the, the way they did it at BK was like groups. So like they, we, we did it all together. It was in front of everybody. Like it was like, and it started with vets. So like I was in the group with the, and this is how I knew they would just like start calling off names. And it was like, vet, 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 Jeffrey Reckis. And I was like, <gasps> and I'm like walking with the vets and I still don't know. Cause I've gotten cut three years in a row. So like, I'm like, we fucking callbacks or some shit like mm -hmm. i'm still sitting there and everyone's like yes dude let's go i'm like no way and it still didn't hit until keep ty like walks in the room and he's just like 
so this is the group. This is the brass group for this year. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, tears flowing down my face. Because, like, how hard we all work there uh, for anybody out there who's had to come from a, a bottom-tier group or just a lower-scoring group to get to where, the, you know, their goal or wherever that goal is for you. Like, finally you're reaching that is it's so hard to get there when I when you finally get there like the the for me it was like gratitude just for like all the people who helped me along the way and it's just like it's unreal it, like you said it just doesn't feel real that you're actually going to be there for the summer yeah and yeah. it was very emotional and I was just ready to do it all so we go into the summer of 2014 um arguably one of my favorite shows it's not my favorite because we're getting there but animal farm 2014 boston crusaders going into the season did they tell you it was going to be the hardest thing you're ever going to do or no. were they just like no this nope. is going to be really like creative fun show that's not going to break your body at all it's chill what was what how how does this all roll out i know show rollouts are different every year how did they kind of present this to you guys they presented this to us in March. Yeah. They told us the show and we're like, okay, cool. And go into the season. And I don't really know what to expect coming from bottom uh bottom group. Yeah, like the bottom. Yeah. And we go in and we start going through move-ins and it's just a completely different ball game it feels like we're yeah. working our ass off of everything and we get to the end of move-ins and we have to perform the show and at that point we had performed bits and pieces and we go to do that run through and i was like Oh, this is just what the top 12 is. Wait, wait, wait. Did y'all not do a full run through till that first one? No, we did a run through. Well, okay. We did a couple run throughs here. Right. Like, once we got the whole show on the field, we, we just I was going to say, if y'all just went out there first show, just no, like that, we're no, done. No, We did run throughs, and I, every time we'd be like, that's just Kicked. running. That's a run. Yeah. That, that's yeah. just a run. Start it's to finish, that show was a sprint. And we just keep going through move-ins. We're like, oh, my God, this yeah. is crazy. And we get to the end of move-ins, and we're like, we have to do this in a uniform, too. Mm -hmm. We do it in a uniform, and we're like, oh, my God. And we go out, finish move-ins, and we go to our first show. We go out there, and I'll never forget, you guys all go to the movies, and you watch oh, it. Oh, yeah. And you watch it. Oh theater we perform and we walk off that field dead all of us are dead and our yeah. caption heads look at us and said all right one down, oh. one down. Mm. We're, like, oh, we're like we got awesome. going and i yeah. remember hearing that on the video they said well that was something yes I specifically remember that the guy, like the guy who does it every single yeah. year that was like, there was no, there, they didn't explain. I remember being in the theaters, no one, no one clapped, no one said a word. It kind of just ended. And then they talked about it and they were like, they are coming out with something a little different this year, but I'm sure they're going to clean it up as the season keeps moving. And it was just like, yeah, Yo. I remember sitting there and I was like, what? What do you mean? I'm like, that was cool, right? Like, why does – no one's excited about this. I, I think yeah. that was a theme for that summer, right, was like um, like the crowds – because of how that show paced out, there was never kind of a moment to be – there wasn't like a clear chord <laughs> off and like, yeah, oh, my God. It kind of just kept moving. So as a performer, like how awkward is that when you keep performing? And you know – like there's moments in the show to like get up about it, but the crowd isn't exactly responding when you get on the road. Like how, how what are the, like, is everybody talking about it? Like, dude, what the fuck? Like we're not getting a crowd response out there. Like how are we supposed to keep like performing? We, we were getting crowd response, but we were also changing the show every, we changed a lot in those first weeks. Yeah. 
those first weeks the show the show's out there it's new mm-hmm. the movement is completely different than it was the day before. yeah we're yeah. learning new stuff in our four to six hour blocks like completely new and we're just like figuring it out and putting the show together to make it work comes just in. as you go throughout a season yeah and so it, it's a lot in the beginning but then we we were getting the applause we needed and we were starting to get the scores we needed too to like keep going mm-hmm. um and that season just kept progressing uh and we we were just doing everything we could to make that show successful and when the summer ended that was the toughest summer of my life it was like physically physically yeah that was the toughest summer of my life but it was the most rewarding at that time too because coming off of my first two summers i was like wow this is what the top 12 is okay let's Mm -hmm. go right and then we go into 2015. I audition again. 75th year. 75th year. Oh, wait. We had from... to talk about two things. We had to talk about two things in 2014. Oh. Just really quick. Okay. Just two things oh, we had to talk about. I have to highlight somebody right here. And I just have a quick question because this is going to be cool. This is one of those tidbits that I want to talk about that I don't know if anyone else is going to talk about. But there was someone, and I brought this up to you before, Um I don't know if the staff ever talked about this with you guys. I think this is super cool as a little nerd about drum corps. Um, There was a group at one point before this season that was starting to form uh, from a certain individual trying to get uh, these groups together uh, in meetings, trying to create um, what I guess we know now. uh, They've kind of made shows about it, but our shows from it. I'll get into it. This group was called the G7. Um, basically what they were trying to do is obviously today we have TOC shows, tour of champion shows. Those are for the top eight groups, uh, specifically perform at those shows. Um, but the whole thing was back then when this meeting was first starting, um, I'm not sure if the TOC shows came from this. I'm not saying any of that, but it could have been from that. But the whole idea behind this, I'll spark note it, was that um, certain individual, who won't be named, you can go find it, um, was trying to have the top eight since his group was consistently scoring in the top three. He wanted to protect the top eight groups and have them be in a league of their own like not just separate shows, but in the league of their own. And on top of that, receive more money per show that they do based on their ranking. And he believed that every group should be getting paid a certain amount based on their placement, based on where they perform, based on this, that, and the other. Now, obviously this gets turned down because the whole community is like, "Are this isn't like the NCAA. Like how conferences are just merging into the Big Ten and SEC now. Like this isn't, this is marching band like be practical here you know be logical um i probably just said two different things or whatever but um did did the staff ever talk to you guys about that during the summer did anyone ever mention that because a lot of that show in 2014 is and i want to talk about this because there is a person on youtube who i watched their video a couple weeks ago uh i want to i want to highlight them uh cj's music uh, the video, I will leave it in the uh, description of this video, a description of this episode. It's called When the G7 Tried to Take Over DCI, and he did a great job of, he talked to, he talked about your guys' show and like design, and but he was talking about the G7 meetings and how this all came about in that story, and then talked about your guys' show and how it was a reflection of how those meetings were just it was bullshit because why would you try to ever do that to marching band? Why would you ever try yeah. to make that happen? So I just, I'm curious, um, did the staff ever talk to you guys about that during the summer or maybe as a means of like motivation or just in general, like, Hey, like we're sitting on the outside of this bubble right now. And they're trying to say that we're not in their league or we're not as good as them. What, like, was that ever a conversation? That was always a conversation. It, it was insinuated that we were going after that. Um, we put a G7 in the show. Yeah, and it's when, one of the dopest sets. In the show, yeah. that's what, what this was about. So badass. We it were is, all, it, yeah. we're the ones looking in, because at that point we were. 
my three summers and the summers prior, we were always the ones looking in. So it, it was insinuated to us, but we as members like knew about it, knew what was going on and used it as motivation, obviously. But like, we also just wanted to beat everyone from yeah. a little 10 to seven. We wanted yeah. to be there. Oh so yeah. We were just working to get there. Yeah. Um, I just, I think that's so like, that's, that's such a cool storyline to have during that summer. Cause just having that motivation every single day, um, of just like competing for that. And it's cool because it's like with that show, you could just feel the fight every single minute of that show that you guys were just fighting to prove that like this show is hard as fuck, but we're going to perform it like to the best of our ability. And it was like, you could just feel that fight. And especially at that G seven set, I think, um, uh, he talks about it in the video, uh, CJ's music, but um, uh, the vocal, which was one of the coolest things before uh, the shots, the famous shots from Boston, um, all cores are always all cores are created equal, but some more equal than others. And then it's the shots. Yep. That is like that from animal Farm. chills, chills for that one. I, I watched, I watched the show again a couple weeks ago um, and so dope that's just mm -hmm. very very cold set very cool um just that that show honestly just very cool show and i want to talk about two more things just very quickly so we go into finals week we're going in um we get to semifinals night now this was i think i think this is okay to talk about this is anything crazy but we're sitting in the audience. It's funny we talked about, like the whole G seven story because now I'm remembering like little kid me in middle school when I watched Blue Coats 2014, and then you came and watched with us, and how I was just like, Ow! Yeah. See, now I, now I get it. <laughs> now I get it. I was a shithead. I was a little shit. I dude, I used to. I was the bando before I started. Don't worry, guys. Like I was a bando too at one point. I wasn't just always like, yeah, dude, fuck it, what the fuck. Like I was yeah, a big bando. Jason mm -hmm. used to come watch the shows after he performed with us. And when that Blue Coast 2014 show, getting to watch that three nights in a row live, oh, my God. Like, as a kid, I lost my mind because we're getting to sit close and we're just – like, I'd never seen anything like that before. That, honestly, I think that might have been the show that did it in for me. I'm not going to lie. Like, I, I, your show and that show and, oh, my God, Crown that summer. I could go on, on and on. But mm -hmm. I want to talk about specifically semifinals. Something very scary happens at the beginning of this performance. Uh, we're sitting in the audience, me, mom, and dad, and we're watching. And the show's starting. Now, you guys start in a little fence set at the beginning of the show. And then from right to left, this set kind of starts to collapse into the tower. And then as you get into the tower set, there is a moment right before the opening hit um, where you guys like chasse to the right from back to front in a ripple. And when this happens, there's a tuba player that goes down. You want to talk about that? Yep. That was my C partner, Nick Kashuba. Uh, right next shout, to me. Shout out, Nick. Shout out, Nick. <laughs> he fell right on my foot, right next to me. So he's right next to you. He's right next to me. We do the chasse across. And I land in my spot and I hear Nick just say, oh, and he falls and his tube is laying right in front of him. Now we're in the back. We're the yeah. last row. So I was like, Nick, you got to get up. Nick, you got to get up. We're about to turn around. We're going. We're snap our horns up and turn around. He's like, I can't move. And we had to turn around and keep going. And he's, he's crawling off. We're in the back of the field at least. And he's yeah. able to crawl off, but we just had to keep continuing. And he was yeah. most of the show for us. So we just had to make sure we made it look like he was still there with us. But he's crawling. Oh. And we finished that show. And all of us are just a mess. We're like, he's, we don't know what happened. 
it's, it's yeah like, it's all we care about and he was not able to perform finals that was his age out year yeah oh perform we go to finals morning and he had gone to the doctor and we were like he's going to perform it's the last show he has to perform yeah, exactly this and is it for him we waited to do the run through and he pulled up got on the field with a brace and oh. then immediately got pulled off because he he got told Couldn't he even wasn't move performing. he got oh. told he was performing and he was like i'm going this is and he still just like yeah. went out there yeah this, that's the whole I, mentality I, that's yeah. yeah um and he was not able to perform it God, yeah, I couldn't even imagine. Very, that. very sad moment. That was like that was seriously one of the scariest things because, especially in those uniforms at that time, um, and then tubas, they all kind of just blend in, especially with those uniforms. Everyone kind of looked the same. So when we're sitting back there and we're watching someone like crawl off, we're like, "Mom, for the first four minutes of that show, like you guys got through your opener," and Mom's like, "I swear to God, I swear to God, get up." get up get up and i'm just like i don't think it's him and she just keeps she's still freaking out and i'm like okay is it him there's no way right yeah. and like oh my goodness I, I still i haven't seen anything like that today and even through my years i never saw anyone get hurt like that just especially on that stage like that i still haven't seen anything like that to this day and i, I remember it clear as day how it happened just where i was sitting watching how slow it was it felt like it took forever for him to Oh, I, I watched yeah. him crawl and someone from the front, one of the officials, like running judges, around while the judges. show's happening. Yeah. One of the judges was running while you guys are doing the whole production. This is semis night. And he is like slowly making your way. And it's like, this is happening on the night before the final night. And you guys have built like, this is all the culmination of this whole season, which has been like an ass kicking to this point. Yeah, I just, I, I had to talk about that. I think that is just that was a crazy moment in time. And then obviously we get to finals night, and this just wraps up 2014. Did you guys as a group talk about it, or was it kind of just the last moment thing, the baby powder at finals? It was something that was brought up and we all laughed about it. Yeah. And then now why was that a big deal, by the way? For people who don't know. Because in Rise, they use baby powder in. It's a, it's I think the quarter, beginning of the show, to like line. create, yeah, to create okay. the effect coming out of the tunnel. Only, it was only one performance they used it. Oh, okay. Quarterfinals, and they use baby powder to come out the gate, and they got penalized for that. Mm -hmm. That's what kept them in their position that they got the entire three nights yeah and so this was like not only was the g7 with the rest of this show and the flags by the way you, but the baby powder at the end was just an extra shot like we're doing our thing and we're working yeah, hard and you need to recognize that yeah you need to put some respect put some respect on our name mm -hmm. now we move on to uh 2015 the 75th anniversary very cool year um, I want to ask, so in the 75th anniversary, very rare, very unique to be a part of a, a season like that. Um, was there anything, what, what, what was something unique that happened in that summer compared to other summers for that 75th anniversary, whether it was like move-ins or tour, what was something special that you guys got to do as a group, um, in that summer for uh, the 75th? We performed at the Boston Pops for 4th of July on PBS, mm -hmm. something I'll never forget. And then we performed at Tanglewood. That was awesome. And it was a very special summer to be a part of. Um, yeah. Just seeing all the history that we had, obviously seeing it in 2014, but you truly saw it and got to be a part of it in 2015, being part of that 75th anniversary. Um, and it was it was just a fun summer. Yeah, it was cool to watch, honestly, from like 
And by that point, I was already convinced on doing drum corps for me, because when you first started, I was still like, no, nah, I'm not going to do the whole band thing. Like, I'm really not going to do it. And then as you kept doing it, especially with that first summer at Boston, after that, I was like fully hooked. And then that summer of 2015, getting to watch you guys perform with the Pops uh, two nights in a row was magical. It was seriously like something, such a rare opportunity to get to do you get to perform with the boston pops uh at the what was it the hat shell or whatever it is um and it was just such a magical year and uh very fun show to watch as well um it was a fun show it was a fun show to perform a lot a lot less hectic um, i was gonna say yeah difficulty wise probably uh probably a little break for you guys it was still difficult but it wasn't yeah as difficult Mm -hmm. uh, but it was still a fun show to perform. Did you guys keep? Did you guys keep staff uh, from 2014 in that 2015 year? 2015, we had a whole new brass and visual staff. At that point. Mm -hmm. I think that's something also to talk about. That's like such a weird thing, and I experienced this too in my second year at Oregon. Because um, you go through your first year at a group. Um, and then you come back for the second and you think you kind of have anything, everything under wraps. And then, you know, everybody, you feel comfortable there now. And then a whole new staff comes in with a whole new philosophy, um, yep. staff from year to year philosophy wise, what the, what, like, what is that kind of like? And how do you kind of like, uh, adjust to those things? Don't have to be super crazy, but I, I found that like, especially it, it's kind of hard to settle in when you're getting a new staff every single year. I never had a consistent staff throughout my career. I had a brand new staff every single year. So it was very hard to kind of like settle into one's philosophy because someone would try to come in every single year, especially a brass caption and be like, this is the brass program that we're running and this is the right way to do things. And then someone would come in next summer and be like, no, don't listen to them. This yeah. is the right. And so you're like, what is like, what is drum corps? <laughs> like, how do you do so this? So my first two summers at Pioneer, same staff both years. Yeah. 2014, 2015, new staff completely. 2015, 2016, we have the same brass staff. We have a new visual staff. So I had a new visual staff every year at Boston. So it was yeah. a different technique every year. Mm -hmm. And it was it was a lot just learning a whole new technique each each summer, but you Didn't you guys do a different one in 2015? Yes. You guys did like a relaxed bent. Yeah. Right? Relaxed. Uh, and 2014, 2015, we did straight leg. Yeah. Yeah. How was uh how was it marching that technique in 15? Like what was like what's the like I don't know, like difference wise and like was it easier? Easier. It's an easier uh, for for your legs, it's, it's easier. <laughs> yeah, especially as a tuba player. No. Especially uh, as a tuba player, too. Straight leg is definitely the one that everyone uses the most, but that relaxed bent was nice, too. <laughs> nice little break. Yeah, nice little break. Um, Let's dive into, because uh, there is going to be a lot, I think, to talk about. Maybe not a lot, but... I think there'll be, we're already at an hour 20, which is I way over what I thought we would get to, but that just means that this has been, this has been good so far. Honestly, just like the whole way through, I don't think there's anything in here that I'd be like, mm, we don't really need that. Like everything in here so far has been, it's been cool. I mean, honestly, taking, taking people through the entire journey. I think this is like, this is the whole goal of every episode is just to get in someone's brain about their whole career and kind of what they were going through inside their mind throughout um drum court and so now we get to the year 2016 which is where my journey is starting uh in drum court and i am determined like you were determined in the beginning to march madison scouts i am determined to the bone at 14 years old that i will be marching the boston crusaders in 2016 i am delusional but i don't know this yet i'm 14 and I go out and I do my first season of high school marching band. And I'm so convinced that I will be marching the Boston Crusaders in 2016. I haven't even marched a season of drum corps yet. I've done like, I've done my freshman year of high school. And I'm saying I will be marching at the Boston Crusaders in 2016. 
we we go to camp in November. And this is year this is year five because he did five years. Um, I, I remember I had a funny way to lead into this, but um, we go to the first camp and it was just a one day satellite camp. Yep. Uh, in Indianapolis, I'm pretty sure, right? We in did that in Indy, and um, you know, it's funny because they, you know. Every core nowadays is like telling you what to pack and putting out like a packing list and all that and what you should like, you know, bring to the camp and what she should have to be successful at a drum corps camp. And Jason Reckis, <laughs> we go to camp. Oh, I'm not even getting there yet. We go to camp. We drive from Missouri to Indianapolis. Pretty sure we like spend the night and then we wake up in the morning and we're going to camp. We're going to camp for the day. No, we we pull. Go- Oh, yeah, we go to the store. <laughs> we go to the store. Didn't have any sneakers. <laughs> five years. Five years, by the way, guys. Five years. Rookie, rookie me is sweating that I like if I have a pencil on my fucking stand to like get ready to go. Jason Reckis walks in in a pair of fucking slippers for November camp. <laughs> He bro, you, you got to sit in the chair all day for November yep. camp. Didn't even have to got, mark. Dude, that's the life. Five year vet. People are like, bro, as you like go along. It's just like, no, actually, you start like you start figuring out as you go along the years. By my fourth year, I tried to bring as like little as possible. My first summer, I brought like way too much. But as you like go along, <laughs> it's so funny. Like you I think um oh, I got way off topic there. Um but yeah, you just kind of figure out like how to pack lighter and lighter. And I just thought it was funny. <laughs> not even sneakers, Actual man. <laughs> not even sneakers, man. Um, but no, we keep going through. Uh, somehow, I think it was really just because it was a satellite camp. And they're like, bro, we're bringing everybody back uh, for January. Um, no, there were a lot. Really? Mm-hmm. I always just assumed like. I think that was the only one day I ever went to. I was like, I never want to go to a one day again because I I don't feel like you get, you don't get the experience you can really get out of a full camp weekend. The staff can't really get a good look at who you are as like a person and a performer. And I just think it's way better to go do a three day because you get to know the people there too. And if you make it, yeah. you want to get to know those people at camp ahead of time. So like a one day is just, if you're, if you can't travel and there's a one day in your area, you should go to that one day. Mm-hmm. But definitely. I, I the definitely won't. I definitely wouldn't recommend like flying for a one day. Like no. I know some people that have, uh, and there was at that camp who I will talk about eventually at some point who somehow we just linked, we, we kept linking at every single audition, like unintentionally. Um, and we ended up marching together in 2016. I don't know if you ever remember him. Uh, he ended up marching Boston in 2017, but, um, Quinn Fleming, that is a name I have not said in a while and a person I have not seen in a very, very long time. But he was at that November camp. And um, obviously, you know, we go to January. Um, we do the audition and everything. And by the way, um, still to this day, besides Blue Nights, I will say, Boston had the most friendly, like, um, Uh, audition environment overall with people there and everybody and i know like just being like the younger brother helps with people just being like friendly to you but genuinely like outside of that people were very like kind helpful and everything which was huge because coming in as a 14 15 year old kid even though i have my like big brother with me i still felt like i needed to like hold my own and like never show a sign of like weakness or like you know fear even though on the inside, I didn't even know where to move most of the time when I was walking, my body was moving, but like my mind was like, just keep moving. I, I just kept like at that January camp when we went, I was like, just keep walking. Like no matter what, don't stop walking. Like just don't stop. Just keep moving forward and something will happen. Um, we'll fast forward. Uh, I get cut in January. Um, uh, like it, now looking back on it, it makes sense. I was 15 years old and a top 12 group is a very mature group. And after marching for many years and marching like throughout the years and marching with other 15 year olds who started, 
it's a it's rare if you can get a 15 year old who actually like understands what they're getting into and then when they get out there for day zero spring training after like a week or two who actually like wants to stick around and like keep doing the summer i only had like one person like through my years that was also like young kid who came in but he also had an older brother who i marched with and like he came in in 2018 he was 15 years old shout out aiden aiden neal and he was a beast and he had an older brother but like he was cool because he came in and he was just like working right off the bat but any other any other people like that just didn't usually stick around so it kind of makes sense obviously you know you get super upset because you're like bro i made it to january i might have a chance you know what i'm saying but you know it doesn't work out that summer uh we keep moving on um I'm doing a little fill in for me here because obviously you're returning for your fifth year overall, your third year at Boston. So we keep moving on uh, for me after I get cut uh, from Boston, I'm trying to figure out where to go after this. Cause I'm still trying to march that summer. I think I still should, um, you know, I think it's still valuable to March that summer. I still wanted to March in the same summer as your last summer. Um, Cause either way, I just thought that would have been cool. And um Shout out a name who we got to bring on, got to bring on um, Mark Martin at some point, because I think there's just a whole other generation of listeners that comes with that from his era. And I think he's got some incredible stories about uh, the marching arts. Um, The the man who literally like sat in my living room and taught me um, like positions, like, you know, like actual like first position, second position, third position taught me how to chasse in the fucking living room. Like, because he was like, if you're going to go audition for Boston, like did did, they didn't do that there? Like, bro, you got to know how to dance a little bit. Cause like, that's at a top 12 level. You need to know how to move. So like, I remember we went in the living room. It was like 30, 45 minutes. Him just showing me everything that I kind of needed to know. So appreciation to him uh but he uh messaged mom actually and was like you know you guys should uh check out troopers and so i'm like fuck it at this point i gotta go somewhere we gotta figure it out so i reach out and uh i had the name uh earlier this week and i i don't know the last name but dennis was there who taught you in 2014. I don't know specifically you because he was a trumpet tech, but he was on staff, I'm pretty sure, in 2014 at Boston. His name was Dennis something. I forgot his last name, but he taught a troop that summer in 2016. Um, and uh, I remember that that's how – that was like my connection that I could know there. Uh, and that's the person who I reached out to and like sent my tape to. And he sent – like he sent an email back and said, you know, come out to a camp. So I'm like, okay, cool. So I make it out there. Quinn Fleming at the camp again. It's my first time flying alone and I'm flying to Dallas, Texas from Missouri. And it's my first time flying alone at 14 years old. I'm not 15 yet. And I'm like scared out of my mind. All I know is I'm just going to keep moving forward. I don't know what's like in it for me. I'm just like, I got to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget flying alone for the first time and then landing in uh, DFW that big ass airport and then like getting the baggage claim and like all i did was like i'm on the phone with mom and i'm like the sign says like this airport's what is this airport like this Mm -hmm. thing's massive and she's like just follow the words baggage claim to wherever the arrows lead you to and i was like how the fuck do i find my bag like all this other stuff so anyway we go through a weekend it's absolutely terrifying by the way as a 15 year or 14 year old just coming out there with all these other like you know 18 to 21 year olds who have been doing it for a minute or just are older, more mature. And you're this kid walking in the room, just trying to like, you know, that was like my first experience of like a cutthroat audition. Yeah. I had never been in an environment like that yet. And it was crazy because it was literally like the visual blocks were so dreadful. It sucked ass. No one talked to each other. Everyone was just looking out for number one, like themselves. No one wanted to even like be friendly, small talk. And the visual staff didn't give a shit about anybody. And yeah. like we get to music and it was like sectionals all day until the night block. And then yep. you were with the brass for maybe three hours. But like the rest of it was just like, eh. and um, my music audition was terrible. Like I remember I like walked out of it and I'm pretty sure I told mom, I was like, yeah, no, I think it went. 
Oh, I like it was bad. Like I walked in fifth, fucking 14 years old and I'm like, Hey, here, play my stuff. And Tim Snyder's like, all right, box drill 190. Let's go. Bink, 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 bink. And I'm like, I'm just standing there and I'm like, and he's just, whenever you're ready, just sitting at the table with another guy and he's got the laptop in front of him. I'm in this big ass gym and we're in the gym and it's just by myself. And you just hear pink, 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 pink. And I'm like, all right. And I just got, it was one of the worst things I've ever done to date. It was one of the worst playing and moving I've ever done. And then my music audition was like, hey, it was all right. It was okay. But I was like, like the movement was the first thing I did out the gate. Like I walked in and it was like 190 box drill, bink. And it was like, oh, I can't do this shit. And I remember at the end of the weekend, um, they, it was like the final like ensemble block. And they're pulling people out in the final block. And I get told, I don't think this is, this is not controversial at all. This really helped me. This put a battery in my back for the rest of my drum corps career. So if anything, I have Tim to thank for this. But he told me when I was 14 years old and I'm sitting there, he pulls me out of block. He said, listen, kid, I don't think you have the potential to do this activity this summer. I think you can take a summer off. Like he, he didn't give me the cut list of go to here. He said, I think you need to like take a summer off, go back home, practice your horn, get better. Just hone in on your craft, go back to your high school, work on your technique and just go, but like go back out next year. And like, it pissed me off. I like cried for the rest of the camp when I was there, just holding back tears, just trying to get through the rest of it. And I'll never forget that stuck with me forever. That moment of coming in, thinking I was just going to get some feedback about like just my numbers or whatever. And flat out, he was just like, so here's where you kind of landed in the horn line for your playing. Visually, you're actually, you were like 25th in the trumpets. You were like right on the outside. So like visually you're okay, but music you're not. So to be honest with you, um, I just don't think you have the potential to do this activity. And I was just like, Oh my God, dude. So like, pisses me off pusses me off but like ultimately puts the battery in my back to keep going and not just prove him wrong but prove to myself that i could do this thing so i forgot how i get to this point i think i really just did it on my own i think i was in class during the week like the next week and i was just scrolling through facebook and the oregon crusaders popped up on facebook saying that they were still taking auditions in march and i was like I'm there. I don't even know who this group is. I've never heard of them. I've never seen them perform. I don't even know if they're real, but I'm going to sign up and I'm going to go. I came home and I told mom, I was like, I got to go. I got to go do it. And she was like, okay, sent out a tape. They said, come out to the camp. I said, I'm there. No prob. And I went and I don't remember that camp at all, but I got a contract. So that was lit. Uh, I don't remember anything about that camp. Oh, I do. Yeah. I did yoga for the first time with Josh Dawes. <laughs> um, I didn't think that's what drum corps was. Honestly, I thought it was just Marty March play play. And yep. Josh Dawes kind of introduced the first of what actually became what the rest of my drum corps experience was, which is a lot of yoga to help out a lot of that body movement. And I thought that was super cool always from the beginning. I know a lot of people who I marched with were like, dude, this fucking weird ass yoga shit, dude. Like, what are we even doing? And I'm like, dude, it's actually pretty cool. Like, it's one of my favorite parts yeah. of the day because like in the midst of like a really crazy summer, something I always look forward to is like when everything kind of just stopped for two seconds and you could kind of catch some silence, you could kind of yeah. catch your breath, just like take a moment to really like center in, and especially those years at Oregon. That was something we really focused on was just like centering in, just being, you know, the mental side of it. Cause that's a big part of it. The mental aspect of the activity. Um, but basically, yeah, we're getting back to 2016, get the contract at Oregon Crusaders. We move into the summer and before this summer starts, we move back to you. Um, I believe it was before the summer started, right? That, something a little off happens going into your age out year. I don't know if you remember what I'm talking about or if you want to talk about that, but you can't because it just so, adds to the trials and tribulations and the shit that you went through to get to where you are. So get through January camp and everything's fine. I go into February. I had the same brass stop as 2015. 
Yeah. Now I'm going into my age out here, not trying as hard as I should with rehearsals. That was one of my questions was in your last year, what is the drive like? And is it hard to find a reason why your why every day in year five? Going into it, I'm like, I'm, I'm there, but I don't have the drive for auditions as I yeah. should. Camp season sucks, just to let everybody know. Especially when you keep going through it, it just gets more and more annoying. So we get to February and I get a wake-up call. And I get told I am an alternate for the season. What? Now, I'm in year three here, year five total, and I'm getting told I'm an alternate. I'm like, mm -hmm. what the fuck? I'm not, yeah. no, I'm not doing it. That was like I, the first reaction was like, I'm not even, fuck this. Like, I'm not even going. Not going. This point is also year three of teaching. Yeah. Everything else, I'm like, I'm done. I'm not I'm not going. Yeah. And for about a week, I'm like, all right, I'll figure it out. I reach out to two people I look up to a lot, um, Mike and Rick Woodall. Um, sadly, Rick passed a few weeks ago. Yes. A month ago, actually. Um, but two people I looked up to at Boston. Two of them Absolutely. Alumni, always took me in, took care of me, always looked out for me in my three years there. And mm -hmm. um, I reached out to both of them, and they were like, we'll see you in March. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm yeah. being told I'm an alternate right now. And I'll never forget the message Mike sent me. Rick said... You're going to be there. You're going to be finishing out your age out here. That's yeah. what. It is. And Mike said, go work your ass off. Get it done. You'll be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I reached out to the core director because the core director at the time reached out to me and he said, are you coming back? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm an alternate. He's like, you are the first alternate. He's like, mm -hmm. if someone helps out or you work your ass off, you have that. Like spot. you're in. Yes. And I said, fine. So March till May, I'm just working my ass off, mm -hmm. doing everything I can. I have told the staff that I taught with because those all teach at Madison. They're all still yeah. teaching. I'm like, I'm an alternate right now going into my year. And they're like, that's fucked. <laughs> Work your ass hey. off. Yeah. And they said, because at that time, people are moving around if you're an alternate. You're moving around court to court. Yeah. They tell me if I'm an alternate, come for a show. I'm going. And like right like, after, like right after the show, just hop on. Yeah, hop on. Come to Madison. That's kind of sick, low key, on some like free agency type shit, like holding out Jonathan Taylor contract type shit. Like, hey, listen, fucking Jim Ursay isn't paying me over here. So kind of like hop on the bus with me. I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> spot and i go into it i get to move ins um joking around some of my buddies where i get to block and i'm all serious for two days i have this in here i have this because i heard because i didn't hear about this from you but in the years when i marched i got taught by people who marched with you and they explained to me uh they what they explained to me is that Jason 2.0 uh, started. <laughs> they all said to me, they're like, yo, marching with your brother? And they always they always talk about like how fun it was. But they're like, dude, I don't know if he told you about 2016. But there was a point in the summer, like even the years after when I would go back to Boston to audition again and I would see like your old friends, um, they'd be like, dude, do you hear about Jason 2.0? And I was like, what the fuck? And they're like, bro, we got to tell you. One day he just like woke up and he was like super positive for some reason. Like he just came to block and he was like, I'm ready to go. Like today is going to be a great day. And we're like, what the fuck, Jason? Like, what are you, where's this coming from right now? Like, what's the energy? Like, and they're like, from there, like that day, like he just, we called him Jason 2.0. He just flipped the switch and he was just, he just switched it up. So two days in, I'm dead serious, and core director comes up to me after one block, and he's like, you got it. You're yeah. in. And I'm like, what? And he's like, your spot's yeah. I'm like, yeah. good. 
Exactly. So I work my ass off. We get through move-ins. And we're doing great. We feel ahead of the game, everything. Get yeah. through We go to our first show and we're like, we're going to beat everyone. And we get to that first show and we're in 12th. Yeah. We get dead. I think we got dead last at that show. At that show, yeah, first, you did. You got well, last. Dead last at the show. And I'm like, what? what the hell did we do? And I'm pissed. And a lot of other people. Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. when I start doing my Jason 2.0 thing because I'm like, well, if all the vets are pissed, like. Someone's got to be not more, pissed. Someone's got to act on their Someone's- and just hype it up. <laughs> Someone's got to hype this shit. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to try it. Yeah. And everyone was in on it. Everyone, once I started, everyone else was like, all right, let's do it buy in i always made the joke before every show that summer we always yell let's show them what we're made of and just <laughs> and get off. And we just keep going through that season i just keep saying it and we got to a point i just hit a wall i'm like i don't know what we're doing i don't know yeah. why this is working but we're not moving and yeah I think it's when oregon Beat us in a caption, <laughs> and I hey, was hey, I stood up in the bus, hey. and I said, <laughs> "Letting my fucking fourteen-year-old brother beat us this summer." <laughs> Come here, dude. We were on a different level, bro. We we came to block the next day. That season was so much fun, bro. We came to block. I remember because it was like a couple shows, like we were beating you and GE. I remember like <laughs> we came to block, and Josh was like, "So." Check like the captions last night. You did you guys know you're you're like beating Boston in GE right now? We're like, oh, what? Like, dude, we were so hyped about that, and we just, oh god, I'll never forget that. Like that moment we got told we were beating Boston in GE. We were like, holy shit, the tree pants band. <laughs> so we get th- we just keep going through. Feel like nothing's working for us. Nothing's in our favor. Madison's beating us out. We're in like 14th place. Mm -hmm. I'm like, if we just get 12, we're in. We're in. Mm -hmm. And we just keep going. Doesn't seem like the cards are ever going to be in our favor. And we just keep saying, quarterfinals, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Quarterfinals will be in 12th and we'll stay in 12th. And we get to that week, backtrack, Sunday. Sunday or Saturday is the last show before. Yeah. And we're in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Yes. And we're sitting there in Pittsburgh. Everything that's gone wrong just continues going wrong for us. Mm-hmm. Nothing's working. And it's right before we're about to step on the field. The core director at the time stops us and he's like, all right, last show before finals week. We're going to Indy tomorrow. Yeah. We also don't have, uh, no, how do you say it? He said, where are we staying? We're staying at a park. Staying mm-hmm. at a park for the week in the mm-hmm. like, visitor center. And we're like, okay, well, there's a lot of field. Guess we're going to rehearse there. And we're like, He's like, do we have a high school to rehearse at? Nope. We have a college to rehearse at? He's saying this to us. Admin's like, nope. Huh. Where are we rehearsing this week? Fucking park. And we're like, okay, cool. And he's like, yeah, but we got somewhere else to rehearse. Where are we performing this week? Lucas Oil. We have a day in Lucas Oil. Our board... Oh, I forgot about this. Oh, for us, finals. I'm so fucking jealous still to this day. We got you six fuck. hours of soil. And that is still one of the coolest things. So we go out and he's like, go put on a show. We put on a show. I think we're in 13th at that point. Yeah. We go and rehearse our ass off in Lucas Oil. We're like, we got this in the bag. We got this in the bag. We're coming. 
a great rehearsal week. And then we get to quarterfinals. Yep. Lay it all out there. Scores come out. 13th place. 13th Fourth place. How, do you, I don't even know how much it was by, but it was just like still. It was point two, I think. Yeah. And we're right behind Madison. It's yeah. Madison, then us. And I was like, of course it is. Of course it is. And I'll say it in- for you, by the way. I'll just say it. Not a good show. Sorry. Oops. I'm just going to say it. 2016 <laughs> Madison, piece of shit. That's all I got. <laughs> that's all I got. And everyone's be like, oh, okay. Oh, so it's, yeah, no, that's what the whole point of the show is. I can just say what I thought. I just didn't like it. Sorry. That, and that, but they can come after me, though. They can come after me. That's fine. I'll take that. I take that's that fine. on my shoulders. That's fine. We were always, always butting heads with them all summer. Yeah. Hated all of them. We were like, we're going to beat their ass. Hey, yeah. the quarter, still 13th. And we, we had dinner that night with mom and dad. Who else was there? Bonias's, and that was me, yeah. you, Carlos, Sam. Was Car- Carlos was there, right? Carlos was there. Yeah, I don't think I was there, though. Uh, was this prelims night or semis? Yeah, quarterfinals. Yeah, I don't think so I was me, there. Carlos, Luke. No, we went back to the yeah, that's right. We went back to the housing site oh, quarterfinals yeah. night because we did we did traditions quarterfinals night and then we went to eat Golden Corral semifinals after we performed. So we did our traditions quarterfinals night. Yeah. So we're all sitting at dinner and we're like, don't know if we have it in us. Luke, Alio, shout out Luke. Me and shout Anderson. out Luke. And Luke's just like, I don't know if I have any more to mm-hmm. give. He's like, we're giving it our all. So Every day. We semis, we're like, if we just get one pop at that crowd, better than them. Yes. Work. And we go out there, have the show of our lives. Mm-hmm. The core director tells us to just break the props because we're sp- the guard is pretending to hit the props and they are breaking. Said- they are smashing the props <sighs> to visual effect, everything. Everything we do to just give it to them. Yeah, effect. And we just lay it out there. Mm -hmm. And everyone went nuts for us. And we finished, we got off the field. And I remember going to the parking lot and just happy. I was like, we we did what we could. You did everything you could. We just broke down. Everyone just broke down in tears and could not move. We're like, if this is it, this is it. And, and it's the fear of like the fear of the unknown, but the fact that you just put everything you possibly could, every single ounce of energy into a performance because you just want to do it one more time. Mm-hmm. That gives me chills and uh, to keep going. Cause that gives me chills. I had down here, like what was the semifinal speech after the show? Like just, we, we did it all. We, we were like, if that's it, that's it. We put on a hell of a show. Yes. We were just a mess. We were like, that's it. That's, that's going to be it. And mom and dad came out. I remember looking at them and saying. That's done. We're done. Madison? All I said, did you watch Madison? And they're like, we saw bits. And I'm like. Did they get a pop? Proud of, who got yeah. more proud of Applause. And they're like, I think you did. I'm like, yeah. Probably. Them. I'm like fucking hope. And you can only hope. All we had was hope. And we walk. Let's see. I remember because we have age out ceremony on semis. Yes. I remember all my friends are like, we're going to the bar mm-hmm. before age out ceremony. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm like, I'm gonna go hang out with my family. We're gonna figure things out. Just hang mm-hmm. out. You know, yeah. And I walk through the stadium with them. And I forget who I'm going to see. I think we were going to see I don't remember. Uh, and yeah, you guys you guys were all together four. because we all went to go eat. Mm-hmm. The whole group went to go eat. So I wasn't with okay. you guys. And then the scores come out. And I just remember seeing like through like those stairwell doors. 
into the, uh, in the stands. I just remember seeing the teleprompter or like the big screen. The big jumbotron where they show the everything. Big jumbotron, yep. And yeah. I just, and I'm like, twelve. There's, a name under it. there's not a there's a name under it. I'm like, who went on before us? And I look and I just see Scout and I'm like, oh. And I like, ran. There's in no way we fucking did it. And we beat them. And, oh. in. and I just fell to the floor. Yeah. I was like, no, no yeah. way did we just do that. <laughs> the whole, it all came full circle at that point of that show. Yeah. That five years, everything. Because our show was Don Quixote. The, to dream the impossible dream. And the five years was just an impossible dream for me. To dream the impossible fun. dream, to do the, to do what people have been telling you was the impossible that you couldn't do trying to like keep you out into like one of my favorite uh, videos. I always huh? get three years in a row from Madison. Yeah. Get yes. Told to make it. Yeah. Beat Madison on the last second to last show of my career with a show about dream, the impossible dream. And yep. make with it. that's po that you can't. that was full circle moment. That's poetry. You literally can't write a script better than that. That is like, that was, that was insane. And one of my favorite clips to go back to, um, we're almost wrapping up here. This has been incredible, by the way. I really can't wait for people to watch this because I think this was incredible so far. I've really enjoyed this. The time has flown for me. Um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time because it's already 930. Um, but this Dang, has been. You made me miss Thursday night football. Football. And wait, first <laughs> off, let's just talk about how I texted Jason earlier today, and I was like, "Hey, well, he texted me, and he said is seven still good for tonight." And I was like, "Yeah." And he was like, "How long do you think it's going to take?" And in my brain, like I'm at work, and I'm like, I "Think all my questions. I think I only take like an hour, it's like maybe max." I'm like, "I still want to watch Thursday night football." He's like, "I didn't even know that shit was happening. I just wanted to know." I was like. <laughs> I th and that's so funny because I was sitting there and I was like there's no way this like hits an hour even I didn't think this conversation could hit an hour like that I was like my questions are like I have a lot but I was like I still think like you know just thinking but I was like to get to I think this is going to be a really awesome interview and um, I don't even know if I'm going to do a I'll still do an intro I'll do like a two minute intro in the beginning maybe but the people will see this later but um, what I was talking about one of my favorite clips to come back to on YouTube. Um, I don't know if you go back uh, and watch, but Boston Crusaders 2016. One of my favorite videos to watch is if you look up Boston Crusaders 2016, there's a video, uh, Boston Crusaders full run and in parentheses semis. And like, it's one of my favorite videos to like show other people, uh, especially when I taught and then, uh, when I marched, um, people were always confused because you'd in my era when I would start, you know, when I, when I was marching and you start meeting people, you start talking about favorite shows. And as I kept getting deeper and deeper into drum corps and figuring out my why and why I started doing it, I always came back to this show for like the fight and the closeness and the tradition and the history and the love for one another and not the care about am I in a certain person? Uh, am I in this group because like everybody loves this group or whatever, or am I in this group? Cause I'm going to win a ring and all this other stuff. It was like, we all love each other in this group and we're all fighting for one common goal. And watching the video back, you can literally hear and see like the fight in you guys. And this is the rehearsal video, the rehearsal run through on semis. Mm -hmm. And like, you can hear in the beginning of the video as the show starting like the staff hyping you guys up and you can just feel like the fight coming off the field and to feel that is so that is so cool to just watch to be able to see that from video um because it's been a minute um the most recent i felt that was this year when i got to watch uh bias i guess uh as an alumni but watching blue knights do the same thing you guys kind of did they had been sitting on the outside for most of the season sitting at 14 and 13 and as an alumni i'm like bro what the fuck like mm -hmm. what are we doing like down to um 
all like Splana and Troop and all these other. I'm like, what are we doing? And then to watch them uh, just make it in, they were in 13th on semis, and for them to just make it in uh, for finals day and get into that 12th spot, and then watching their finals performance, that was like, I I could feel it again. You could feel the fight, and you could see it in their eyes. And I think something like that is just um. It's priceless. It's so special. I really, yeah. um, it's one of the parts of drum corps that I love just watching. Um, cause that's what it's all about at the end of the day is when you get to that end of the season, the culmination of really the work that starts in November for all of these, yeah. these kids, the staff, everybody who's involved watching that come to fruition, very special and very fun to watch. Yeah. Um, and I think eventually as I kept going, I picked up on that a lot as like why I did it not for placement score, whatever. I barely remember any of my scores. I just remember the people in my seasons. And that is something I always try to tell other people too. When, you know, whether it was me choosing not to march some summers or whatever it may be, or just talking, even when I taught like talking to kids about where they should go. I'm like, I think you should just get like, just get started. Just go somewhere and start no matter where it is. Cause everyone's just like, dude, I'm going to go to Blue Coats, actually. Like, I talked to one of the kids I was teaching who had just come off a year in Music City. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like, where are you thinking about, you know, going to? And he's like, yeah, I'm probably just going to Blue Coats. And if that doesn't work out, I'm probably not marching. And I'm just like, bro, I think you should still, like, do it no matter what. And it's like, it would be hypocritical. Yeah, you're getting hypocritical. Or um, you're getting experience either way. And I guess it could be hypocritical for me because obviously, like, when I was in, you know, the sub 12 groups, um, you know, you're thinking about, cause you want to be there Saturday night. It's so cool. You've been watching the videos forever with your friends. So you want to get to that Saturday night spot. And something I want to talk about. Um, and I don't know if you experienced the same thing, but I only got to experience it one time, uh, was when I finally made it there to Saturday night and I did the show, I had tears in my eyes, like as I walked onto the field and I finally got to look up at the banner and finally see the names finals i got to see that word and i got to see 9 30 on the time like when you walk in and you look up and you just see the clock and i finally got to see a late number and like everything like that got me emotional but right after that show was done it was the weirdest feeling in the world for me because all within a snap of a second it felt like the whole reason of why i ever did this just came to me right in that moment I was like, you just had one of, you had the most fun summer of your life up until this point. And it wasn't because of just this night or just this score, just this placement, by the way, like you just had so much fun this summer because of the people on your left and your right. And the people you got to spend the entire summer with in this, this, um, this perfect storm of a group of people. And that's when I finally, I felt like I figured it out when I yeah. finally got, I made it to finals. I finally got to do Saturday night and I realized it wasn't even about Saturday night at all. And I thought up until then that I had to make Saturday night and I did. Yeah. And I had watched friends before me, make it before me. And I celebrate them cause I love all of them. But when I finally made it there, I realized I was like, this isn't why this isn't the why the, like the why has been in front of me the whole time, you know? And I just think that's something that I also talk to people about too, who stress about, only talking about top 12 groups you know i think um it's so cool to watch groups um like troop and cults who when i marched were kind of in the same boat as me where we were just fighting in that top 15 kind of area um seeing them break through and all that as well um uh i don't know where i was going with that last part listen we're two hours in we've talked through this entire thing honestly this has been incredible. This has been a really awesome interview. I've had a really good time. Um, had a great time. A couple of like quick hit questions here at the end, just to wrap us out. I know I've asked a million, but when it finally came to a close for you, um, I'm interested to know when it finally came to a close for you, did you feel like a sense of peace with where you got to leave the activity or did you feel a sense of like, Oh my God, this whole thing's ending. Like what now? It was it was peaceful. It ended the way the best way it could. Mm-hmm. The best way it could end was the fight to the end. Yeah. With everything through the five years. 
that was exactly what I needed it to be, or that's how it should have been. Yeah. Um, definitely felt like, what am I going to do after this? Like, what am I going to do with my summers? What's going to happen? I'm going to graduate college the following year. Yeah. So it's a lot of just thinking about all that, but it was a rewarding, I look at it as the most rewarding summer of my life was 2016. Mm -hmm. out of the placement no matter anything it was just the most rewarding i've ever had and yeah it was that's so cool mentally but it was the best yeah um couple quick hits i think we already talked about most unique thing that happened uh getting to perform at the pops Mm -hmm. come on that's pretty cool that was pretty dope um over your five years, uh, favorite venue that you got to perform at? Ooh, favorite venue? I know. Yeah? 2015. Oh, fuck, I know what he's going to say. <laughs> fucking assholes. Fucking ass. and, and then to match you, I say, was your home show at a professional was. football stadium? That's all I got. That's all I got. Because mine was. Mine was in 2019. It was a a home show because it was our 75th anniversary performance at Gillette Stadium, home of the six-time Super Bowl champion, New England Patriots. New England Patriots. (laughs) (laughs) I think I cried as much as I did that day. I think I cried as much that day when I stepped on that field as I did on semifinals the following year. Yeah, I remember getting into my the pose at the beginning of the show in 2015, just kneeling down on that field, and I was just looking around. I'm like, I've been you following. Made it. I did this. Yeah, this is and how- like you're here now, and this is your field for the night. And like you grew up as a kid, getting to watch Tom Brady be a god. Yeah, on that field. And um, that's my team, and now I get to perform in their stadium. And now you're performing like on their field in their stadium. Um, that was a really cool show. Uh, I got to go and see that live. That was that was a really cool show. Uh, the weird thing about professional football stadiums, except for the ones that are domes for some reason, same thing happened in Mile High. They do this shit where like they take out like the full like markings of the field, and that always like no, they did that on that show because it was set up for the soccer team. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's real. Set yeah, up the revolution. <laughs> I think the same. I don't know if that was happening in Mile High either, but like literally, like when we walked out there from Mile High, even when I was there with Oregon too, um, it yeah. would literally just be you had lines. You just had the just these, just the ones, the ones that are already there, and then the tape tashes. Like that's yeah. all you kind of had. And I was like, damn, kind of wish we had the full thing to make it feel, you know. But that's yeah, just a whatever but that is that's really cool yeah gillette stadium and that was i think that's the only time a show if i'm not mistaken that's the only time i've ever seen a show there because i don't think it happened any other year someone will fact check us if we're wrong but that that was yeah that's a really rare very cool opportunity um favorite free day disney world 2016 easy we performed Performed in Epcot that morning and did a parade, and then we had the entire day in Epcot. Probably the most fun I've ever had. So jealous. <laughs> oh, wait, no. Uh, was your favorite free day not the San Antonio free day in 2016? Was it not that one? You didn't like no, that free that day? Was <laughs> Let's talk about that. Yeah, do we want to talk about that a little bit? I guess we yeah, we can do it real quick. So, yeah. um, so 2016, I get told the week prior, Jeffrey's group is sick, uh, dealing with some illness. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm like, we're not. I'm like, we're yeah, going to you know survive at this point. We're still in 14th place. Yeah, and we get to San Antonio, and the. Performance happens. I see Jeffrey right after the show. I'm like, hey, great job. I'll see you tomorrow. We have a free day, right? Yeah, I'll be there. Didn't, wasn't that the night that um, we shared a food truck during that season, right? Did we do yeah, that we that season? That we did it one night when we were at a show. Mm-hmm. I think and that's then, where like it happened. And it was like, because you guys found out that we were sick. And it was like, yeah, you guys like, kind of have to go what? over here to eat. Yeah. And so the next day comes around. 
And I text you and I'm like, hey, are we still going to hang out? We'll meet you at the mall. Yeah. I just see you walk up. You have a new bag and everything of clothes. I'm like, what are you? Why do you have clothes? Did you buy clothes? And you're like, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> and we walk through the movie theater. I'm like, we're going to see a movie. Okay. We're going to see Finding Dory, by the way. I'll never forget. Dory. I'll never forget that whole fucking day. And what? Not even two minutes later, you walk to the stairwell and just throw up everywhere. I'm like, I started coughing, and you're like, yeah. Yeah, right? And I was like, yeah. And I called him <laughs> and I said, someone needs to come take care of him. I can't. I'm not getting my group sick. Someone That needs gets to us. Yo, literally, this is a great <laughs> transition right now because the person who we called to come get me is coming on next week for the next episode. Riley Fitzpatrick, <laughs> my first C partner. My first C partner ever in drum corps will be on next week's episode, and I'm sure we will talk about what happens after Jason leaves me? Because in older, like he, my mom goes, she's like, why did you leave him? And even I say, I'm like, mom, he had to go. Like he had, like I when waited, it's like that. I finally got there. I'm like, all right, you got this. Be safe. Yeah. I was gonna... like, all right. Like yeah. I didn't, I wasn't like, I was like, he has to go because like that's, uh, our group was in like shambles every day. Like I remember that summer we, we battled with it the whole summer. It started on July 4th. Yeah. Uh, when we did the parade in Oregon on uh, Seaside, that's probably one of my favorite spots I've ever been to. Uh, that was beautiful. But it started there. And then throughout the season, we just battled it the whole time. I remember like Broken Arrow, we were down like 20 brass. So like yeah. it looked like there was just holes all over the field. We fought it all year until the very end. So like the reason why I wouldn't tell you, though, that I was not like I probably could have texted you. But it was my very first year. And if it was any other year, I would have just been like, hey, guys, I'm sick today. Don't worry about me. Like, But this was my first year. And yeah. by the way, and it will be talked about in other episodes, this was the Oregon Crusaders' very first free day of the summer. Mm -hmm. It was our first day off. Yep. We had never, besides a laundry block or something, we never got a free day. We were supposed to have one at the mall of america after the weber state show and after the weber state show we all got together as sections and they said we're gonna vote and they said the staff has come together because we, on that schedule that summer is so crazy because as soon as we hit the road there wasn't really time to like it, there was no time to like clean or anything or add anything yeah. because we had so many back-to-backs or like maybe one rehearsal day and then show 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 like it was it was a really crazy schedule uh not as like watered down as it kind of is now it was a lot of like back to back like there was some nights it was three like three shows in a row and so like there's no time to like clean or change anything in there and we're a top 15 group at that point trying to make a fight for top 12 because we think we can our brass line was phenomenal yeah. that summer it was great um and so the brass staff the staff uh told uh all the section leaders to go talk to their sections and say hey we're putting it to a vote who wants to do the free day tomorrow at mall of america because we had the regional in minnesota which doesn't happen anymore but that was a very cool regional by the way but they said vote like if you want to do the free day or if you want to rehearse tomorrow because and they and they were like <laughs> they fucking tricked us bro because they said there's no bias there's no like there's no punishment if you want to do the free day tomorrow like i get it because it would be our first time off and it was on tour nowadays like they're getting days off like every fucking sunday like by 19 i was getting every sunday off at bk but like this summer like this was going to be our first day off and it was in july we started this shit in may we were finally going to get a day and when we were just the day before that first free day after Weber State, they said, we're going to vote on it. We literally, we vote the entire trumpet section. I'm pretty sure. We literally just talked about this. The 16 chat revived like two weeks ago to talk about this. Like we all voted. I'm pretty sure we were just like, yeah, we want to do the free day. We want a day off. We get on the bus to go to the next spot. We all get the message in the Facebook group that show up tomorrow morning, ready to go for brass block first thing in the morning. Mm. BKG Bracker Green put us through the fucking ringer that next morning. He brought us all in. He said, "Are you fucking kidding me?" And we were like, "Oh fuck!" Like <laughs> he said, Mall of America? 
you don't you don't want to get better today. You want to go to the Mall of America? And he was like, back out. We held the horns up for I think like 25 minutes in a row. Didn't put oh. him down. Just played like long tones, like long tones. Oh. And it was on, and it was on his like it wasn't like a set exercise. It was like, we're gonna start on G and we're gonna go down and we're gonna go up and we're just gonna keep him up. Because, because by the way, and he would always play the mind games all season. This is how I got so good, like after my rookie year, because he played the mind games all season. He would just, as you're playing and holding it up deep in like 10, 12 minutes in, still having him up. He's like, and by the way, you didn't want to, like, you didn't want to come get better today, by the way. You wanted this, like, you wanted, you wanted the free day today, by the way. And then, like, you, like, after the 25 minutes, like, we put the horns down and, like, we ran around the entire field. It was crazy. But yeah, that's why I was like, I was so upset on the San Antonio free day, basically to wrap back around to it because I had not gotten sick all summer. I had avoided coronavirus or fuck not coronavirus. <laughs> what was it called again? Uh, norovirus. Oh, what you guys had? Norovirus. That's what yeah. it was. It was norovirus, and I had avoided it all summer. And I was like, I don't. I'm good. I woke up. I was fine on the San Antonio regional day. I woke up on the San Antonio free day. My stomach didn't feel good. I was like, something's off, but I think I'm good. I think it's just like what I ate last night. I think we're chilling. Let's go for the free day. I notice I'm like way more sluggish and tired than I normally am. I'm like, might be tired because we're getting a day off. So my body's like starting to go into rest. I take a nap on the bus ride to like the mall. And as we're getting down to the mall, we hit a bump and we hit the bump. And like, I just looked over at Riley and I couldn't like. It all came up at once. And I was like, Riley, you got to give me the bucket. Because at that point in tour, we just had buckets everywhere and like quarantine areas for people because it was just like normal at that point. So there's just buckets everywhere. So you could just be like, I was just like, yo, Riley, give me the bucket right now. I threw up into that bucket and like I throw up and I'm immediately crying because it's set in that like my free day's fucked. I don't get a free day. Like this is I'm sick all day. I have to go find like medicine. I have to go like. So that whole morning is me getting off the bus and I know I can't like get anybody else sick. So yeah. like, I just have to go around San Antonio, find a Walgreens somewhere and get some medicine. And then a whole lot of other things. And I had clothes because you can obviously guess why uh, throwing up all over them and disgusting stuff. So got to go to champs. Yep. Shout out champs. <laughs> Shout out champs. Um, honestly, I think, I think that's going to be a wrap. I think that's gonna be a wrap on that. Yeah, the San Antonio Free Day is a wrap. But um, no, what a, uh, what a great way to end it, right? Uh, I mean, otherwise, the last, the only thing I have that I didn't hit on, um, other core hypes stolen. This was the thing that happened always throughout tour when you would see other people, see other cores pull up. Uh, all cores kind of have their own hypes. This was some drama in 2018 or 2019 when BD stole the crown hammer and like made a whole meme out of it and it actually became like some drama it was pretty funny i'm not gonna lie that's fucking funny. hilarious that's pretty hilarious did y'all ever have because i think in i think at bk i think we might have i don't know but did y'all ever have something like that where did y'all have your own hype did you steal anybody else's hype like those were stories i always heard so i don't know if y'all ever did that kind of thing no comment Oh, let's go. <laughs> Honestly, adds to the mystery. And I love it. I love it. It adds to the mystery. And that's a good way to end it right there. Just leave it on a mystery note. It's like, did we? I don't know. Maybe. Could have. Um, could have. Maybe not. Probably not. Um, but we'll go ahead and we'll wrap it there. Two two hours and 15 minutes in. Um Dang. this was way longer, and it went way longer than I expected. But I this was amazing. This was an awesome. This good. is it's just a good conversation, a great interview. Um, yeah, I don't even know how to like honestly just to wrap this up, but thank you for taking the time tonight. We're recording hey. this on a Thursday night. Um, yeah, just thank you for taking the time and just talking for two hours. I know it can be like, you know, very you know, at some points in the conversation, it's like, God damn, when's this ever going to end? You know, like, just shut up. Stop asking questions. You know, it's like, I want to watch no, this. Thursday Night Football. <laughs> this was good. But no, this was great. Um, this is a great conversation. 
Uh, you got to come back on, obviously, to co-host for some other special guests that we'll have on in the future. Um, Andrew Lemaire, absolutely. I already talked to him. We got to have you back on for that episode. Um, but yeah, I think we'll call it a wrap here. This was episode two of Meet the Bus. I'm your host, Jeffrey Reckis. We had on Jason Reckis today. Today was a great conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Um, yeah, the the support and the love so far for this podcast has been awesome. It's been it's been crazy. I can't believe how many people are like wanting to listen to this show and like support it. So please like like and subscribe if you love the episode. Um, please share with your friends. Share with everybody you can. And um, yeah, we're gonna keep this thing rolling. So on to the next week. Um, yeah, I think that's gonna be a wrap. Thanks for having me.